state emergency. Um, the city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. Uh, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Gordon. Here. Fletcher. Here. Johnson. Here. Paul Masano. Present. Bender. Here. Chair Reich. Here. There are six members present. We have a quorum and we'll proceed with today's agenda of which we have 24 items, um, two of which are discussion, one is a public hearing. The remainder are consent items and I will go through those. Anyone will pull them from the committee for further deliberation if they wish. Item two on the consent uh, is the Downtown Council Nicollet Mall Concert Block Event Permit for July 29th. Three is the Downtown Minneapolis Neighborhood Association National Night Out Block Party Event uh, for August 3rd. Four is the Downtown Council Nicollet Mall Concert Block Event for August 12th. Five is the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District Nicollet Mall Street Art Festival Block Event Permit for the 13th and 14th of August. Six is the Basilica and St. Mary Block Event Permit for September 10 and 11. Seven is the Downtown Business Improvement Special Service District Renewal of Ordinance, setting that public hearing for September 15th. Eight is the Downtown Business Improvement Special Service District 2022 Proposed Services and Service Charges, and that public hearing will also be on the 15th. Nine is the Special Service Districts, uh, the 428A Districts, uh, the 2022 Proposed Services and Charges, and that public hearing will also be on September 15th. 10 is the Land Exchange for Anoka County to facilitate electrical infrastructure improvements to the Minneapolis Water Treatment Campus in Fridley. 11 is the easement agreement with Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad for a portion of the right of way within Irving Avenue between Laurel Avenue West and Curry Avenue. 12 is the infrastructure improvements and maintenance easement agreement with BIT NLG uh, Investors LLC for the 5th Street North Bridge adjacent to the proposed North Loop Green 3 development. 13 is the agreement with Hennepin County for Grand Avenue Street Reconstruction Project. 14 is the grant of MnDOT for the Clean Transportation Pilot Program. 15 is the Near North Safe Routes to School Project, layout approval and easements. 16 is the contract amendment with Power Mation Division Incorporated for providing supervisory control and data acquisition software and licensing. 17 is the contract with Short Elliott Hendrickson Incorporated for engineering and design services for 37th Avenue Northeast Street Reconstruction Project. 18 is the contract with the same company for historic bridge rehabilitation design and services for the Nicollet Avenue Bridge over Minnehaha Creek. 19 is the accepting of the grant from the Minnesota for the central state of Minnesota for the central city parallel storm tunnel construction project. 20 is the bid for the central city parallel storm tunnel project. 21 is the bid for the ramp B waterproofing and structural repairs project. And 22 is the bid for the 2021 storm sewer televising project. Does any committee member wish to pull an item? Not seen an indication. Um, I will move those items and ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Council member Fletcher. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Council member Fletcher. Chair Reich. Aye. There are five ayes. Those items carry and we can now proceed to the public hearing portion, which is item one snow ice removal from public sidewalks assessments and I'll give the floor to our director. Thank you Chair Reich, committee members. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike Kennedy, Director of Transportation Maintenance and Repair will introduce this item. Thank you, Director Charlie. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Again, I'm Mike Kennedy. I'm the Director of Transportation Maintenance and Repair for Public Works, which is the division that manages um, enforcement of the snow and ice 
sidewalk ordinances. Each winter season, Public Works enforces the city sidewalk shoveling ordinance. For properties in violation of this ordinance, Public Works sends a notice to the property owner. And if the property owner, owner remains in violation, then Public Works hires a private contractor to remove the snow and ice on the sidewalk in front of the property. All property owners receive a bill for the completed work. If the owner does not pay the bill, the cost of the work will be listed on the assessment roll and assessed to the property taxes as a special assessment on January 1 of the next year. If the property owner wishes to contest the cost of the work, they have the opportunity to appeal at an administrative hearing. If the property owner is satisfied with the determination of the administrative hearing officer, <clears throat> no further action is necessary. If the property owner wishes to contest the administrative hearing offers determination, they may choose to appeal at a public hearing before this committee. If the, if the appeal is denied by the committee, they may then appeal to the district court. This appeal must be made within 30 days after the adoption of the assessment rule by the city council. A list of properties and the charges to be assessed has been provided at the, at the public hearing today. The properties on the list to be assessed dated June 30th, 2021 and on file with the City Engineer's Special Assessment Office had the snow and ice removal work done by the city during 2021 season. And were sent a bill for the cost of the removal work and were notified that a special assessment for the removal charge plus interest would be paid through the billing process. The amount to be assessed is a special assessment principle is the cost of the removal of the work. The total pr principal amount of the proposed assessments on the list of properties to be assessed is on your list. The assessments would be collected in their entirety on the 2022 real estate tax statements with interest. The interest rate will be 2.1%. Information is provided in the notices as to how people may prepay the, prepay the assessments in full without interest if they so choose. Here's a short summary of the initiatives the department led uh, to increase the awareness and improve compliance with sidewalk shoveling this past season. Last winter, a letter was again sent to Minneapolis property owners with details about shoveling requirements and a reminder of the importance of shoveling your sidewalk to keep Minneapolis accessible for everyone in the winter. Residents can now check the status of uncleared sidewalk snow and ice cases in Minneapolis using the city's new interactive dashboard on the city's website. And 311 has a list of four higher sidewalk shoveling contractors, and there may also be additional resources for people who need help clearing their, their sidewalks. So they should check with 311. Public Works held four administrative hearings for people who wanted to contest their bills. People attended or sent written objections, and the hearing officer reviewed testimony or the written sub submittals. As usual, the most common complaint that we hear is that people didn't receive their warning letter or the OTC or order to correct letter. It went to the wrong address. It's an out of state property owner or they want it sent to a property manager. We acknowledge that there are problems in the mailings. There are in some incorrect addresses, uh, slow mail, lag in the title transfers, or it may not be going to who the, the person wants. That doesn't mean that they are not responsible to up their or their update. They are responsible to up their date their records at the assessor's office if they want immediate changes. But our letter is simply a courtesy. There is no obligation in the ordinance for that we have to provide any notice at all. We try to do the best we can given what we've got, but it doesn't always work. The snowfall, the snow on their sidewalk is the notice. Property owners are responsible to pay attention and shovel or clear as needed and when needed. Other complaints we hear at the, uh, heard at the administrative hearings, uh, my sidewalk is adjacent to the curb and the street plows cover my sidewalk after I shovel it. We have hundreds of miles of situations like this and property owners and plow crews have to share the snow storage space along the curb. Unfortunately, it does mean that sometimes people in this situation have to reshovel more often than others might. If they keep a path wide enough for a wheelchair, they won't be sighted. If they keep, uh, if plows do something extraordinary, they really bury it more than anybody else. Uh, property owners can report that to 311 and crews may come out and help if they did something really different. Another thing we hear is $239, which is the amount to um, uh, the charge amount to have your sidewalk cleared by the city. They say that's a ridiculous amount. I got estimates for less. Well, 
we take competitive bids to do this work. Tractor, contractors have to have adequate staff, equipment, materials to respond to hundreds of work orders. You might find someone to come out and shovel your walk right after it snows for 75 bucks or something, but to come out to the site up to 10 days later when the snow has been compacted and bonded requires a lot more work, heavy machinery and time. <clears throat> Often crews must make a second trip to allow for ice, the icing materials to work. This is a reasonable competitive price. So our recommendation for today is passage of resolution adopting and levying the assessments and adopting the assessment rule for sidewalk snow and ice removal charges for the 2020-2021 winter season on the list of properties dated June 30, 2021. That concludes my presentation. Uh, we've got a, myself and a team here to answer questions. We believe that there are people who uh, are here to testify. And so uh, we'll turn this back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy, for that. Does anyone from the committee have uh, questions per the presentation from staff? Not seeing any indication. Um, I will now open the public hearing and see if we have anyone signed in and we would take that in order. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Oh, here we go. Um, Hi, first Robert person, Terry. I have the first, well, actually the first person I'm gonna take in order is Nick Hammer. Nick Hammer, if you could state your name and address for the record. Chris Hammer and Um, can you hear me? I can hear you now. If you could repeat that, right. please. Yep, no problem. Uh, Nicholas Hammer, 3608 23rd Avenue South here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55407. I'm uh, one of council members Andrew Johnson's uh, neighbors somewhat. <laughs> uh, yes, please proceed. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, so on uh, the 1st of, of January, uh, according to the records that I got from uh, uh, the sidewalk committee was that uh, somebody said that, you know, uh, my my walkway wasn't wasn't cleared. Um, your office dated the letter on 1-4, which was a Monday. Um, and the contractors came out on uh, Friday morning, which was 1-8 and that, that afternoon is when I received the letter. Um, so really for me, um, the reason I, I came to uh, this meeting was to just ask. So I didn't, I had cleared my walkway as best as I thought that I w was doing it. And I had cleared it a couple times because we had a bunch of snow that week too. So everything was really just uh, a mess. So. You know, I had thought that I had cleared it enough. Um, it turns out that I, I had not, according to uh, your crew on Friday morning. So uh, I received the letter at noon. So I was kind of unaware that anybody had um, said anything. So what, what do I need to do differently? I mean, besides clear it more than I had cleared it, I guess. Um, so I guess that question would be directed to either, I guess, Mike Kennedy here. Yeah, I uh, we uh, note that question and what I typically do um, to make the meeting run smooth is I take all the testimony and then we respond um, uh, as a group. Um, and so okay. we've, we've noted that and thank you for your testimony, sir. Yep, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I guess that that's all. Basically, I, I w I'm wondering if um, either I would I would like the sign removed if possible. Um, in the six years that I've owned the property, I haven't had any other problems like this. So I do apologize for having to have people come out like this. Um, so yeah, I just never received the notice in time. So <laughs> and you've already talked about that, Mike Kennedy. So anyways, thank you. And uh, I'll mute myself now. Oh, thank you. Um, the next person in queue is Phyllis Khan. State your name and address for the record. Yes, okay, my name is Phyllis Kahn. My address is 115 West Island Avenue. And I'm dealing with a specific, it, it actually sounds very similar to the previous one. It's case number CE 
1256413. And I received um, a bill for ice and snow removal. And what had happened was um, I, I, I had someone hired who clears my sidewalk and my path to my house at, at, at right after every snowstorm, as soon as he, as soon as he gets out. And the, um, and apparently, you know, he had done this. And then apparently after he did that, the snowplow came by on the street and had a wide enough uh, uh, path of pushing snow that it covered it with snow again. And so, um, and so then I got the note, you know, I checked to make sure that it had been cleared. And you could even see that the pathway to my house, you know, not the side hurt. So, um, so I can, you know, I complained about that. I was then told, one of the things I was told was that if it was tamped down too hard for me to dig up, I could then just cover it with, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the stuff so that people don't slip on it, which I proceeded to do that. And then anyway, even though that was done, the, uh, parent, the sidewalk crew came down and dug it and dug it all up. So, and I got this bill for two hundred and thirty nine dollars. When I talked to the person who cleared my sidewalk, he just laughed at the size of that bill. He said his charge to do that would have been about seventy dollars. So anyway, that's that's my complaint. And I believe I've submitted the, um, the per person I was. I believe I've submitted a lot of evidence on this. So Lisa Brown was the person I was working with. Uh, thank you for that, and I'm sure we do have a record of, of, of that information and appreciate your testimony and we'll have staff respond to um, all the testimony when that part of the public hearing is concluded. So, it, it, so will that be today? Or oh yeah, that's no? definitely going to be today. Um, as, as soon so as the last I, speaker speaks. Should I still keep listening to the public hearing? Or yeah, I would. Or will the, or will yes. the staff call me? Yes, yeah, certainly listen uh, because there will be a response forthcoming. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next in queue, we have uh, Robert Carey. Please state your name and address for the record. Hello, can everyone? Can hear you fine. Please address the committee. Hi, can everyone hear me? can hear you. Uh, good afternoon, chair and committee members. My name is Robert Carey. My address is 3901 22nd Avenue South, Minneapolis 55407. Um, I'd like to contest the findings that our household was in violation of City of Minneapolis Ordinance 445-20. Um, Per the ordinance and guide below, the issue or violation in question was not the removal of snow within the first four hours of daytime after snow se snowfall ceases, rather the melt and refreezing of water to ice and the responsibility to clear by sand or salt resulting in ice. During the time between the notice of the city's contract or removal of ice buildup, there was either no snowfall or no snow was removed in accordance with this ordinance. I'd like to point out that the property is a corner lot and as a property owner, we have clearly adhered to the ordinance as the sidewalk facing the west, as well as the ADA compliant curb cut that has none of the issues being presented in this citation. The reason our house sits on a highly elevated lot with severely sloped incline and two gutter outlets on the north facing side in question. In addition, the city sidewalk is not level and it aids to the buildup of snow melt that puddles then causes ice spots when refreeze occurs. During the time that the notice was provided between January and February, where the salt that our household applied to manage ice was less effective due to temperatures where salt is less productive. We have pictures to support not only the application of salt, but also the unlevel sidewalk that causes ice melt to build up that does not impact the ability to control ice buildup when temperatures spike between below freezing and then above even with salt and or sand mixes. 
we are responsible property owners and comply with this ordinance and believe that uh, that this has established by the west facing care of our sidewalk and the ADA curb out cutout. It does not have the unique qualifiers of the north facing sidewalk. We would like to request a reconsideration of the penalty on the initial assessment. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, it is noted and uh, we will respond uh, accordingly. Um, I'm not seeing anyone uh, on the signed public hearing queue, um, but I will, if there's anyone on the line, you can press star six and address the committee by stating your name and address. Not hearing anything, um, I will close the public hearing and call upon Mr. Kennedy to give some response to the um, testimony given today. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, start with Mr. Hammer. Um, he seems to, uh, his question is, what do I need to do to avoid this in the future? And I understand your predicament. It does appear that you are trying to be responsible. Our inspectors are out there to enforce the ordinance. And I think the key is we, we did get complaints on your sidewalk. That's why we responded. Um, it may just take a little bit more effort for you to stay vig vigilant on it. When you get that ice buildup, um, apply, sprinkle some sand down to, to provide for traction and then shovel it as soon as the temperatures uh, are in your favor. Um, that's basically what the ordinance says is that, uh, is that you need to shovel it and keep it clear, full width down to the pavement or sprinkle sand when um, it's it's too the ice is too much bonded and you can't get it off. So I guess just a little bit more vigilance, I think, is the answer there. Um, for Ms. Khan, um, as I alluded to in the beginning of my presentation, this is one of those situations where we have a sidewalk adjacent to the curb, and we have to um, we have to share that snow storage. Now, um, I appreciate that um, you said that you were out there within the 24 hours to clear it. But remember, you have that sidewalk right next to the curb. The plows are coming, the plows, you're on the odd side of a residential street, as you know. So you know that the plows come on residential odd side plowing day, two to three days later. So you, yes, you may have to clear it again. Um, if, as I said before, if, um, if it really gets plowed in badly, call 311 and supervisors may come out and, and check it out and they may help you out if they've done something really extraordinary. When we, the answer isn't that you can sprinkle sand on camp down or walk down on snow. We still need to see the effort. We still need to see it widened as much as possible or take, uh, uh, plowed out as much as possible. Uh, the click pictures clearly show that there's still a lot of snow there. I've heard committee members um, talk about impassable sidewalks that we want to avoid. That's almost the definition of an impassable sidewalk for someone who is disabled. Uh, and so you need to try to make an effort. And, and if crews see that uh, it's been shoveled as wide as possible, if you've cleared it wide enough to for a wheelchair to pass, sprinkle that sand and there's effort being made, then um, the inspectors would go by and the contractors would not do the work. So again, we appreciate your efforts to be a good citizen. And Mr. Carey, some of the same kinds of comments. Yes, you have a very difficult situation with the high side slopes uh, on your lot. Um, again, we were responding, our crews and inspectors were responding to complaints. Somebody felt it wasn't good enough. Um, and we do provide free sand for those of you who are listening. Um, check our website and in those situations and you can see in the pictures, had there been some sand sprinkled down there, salt doesn't always do it. And we know you're gonna have um, uh, uh, meltwater across and refreeze. It's just unfortunately gonna take more diligence. But if it looks like there's effort been made, then typically people won't call and um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't gig a situation like that. So those are the comments that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Um, and I will now ask um, if there's anyone from the committee who wish to make comment. Um, if not, um, I would move this item before us and ask the clerk to um, confirm approval. Councilmember Gordon. 
Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Chair Rake. Hello. Aye. There are six ayes. And that moves forward. I'll note um, again that the public hearing has been closed and we can proceed um, to the discussion items. I will give the floor quickly to Councilmember Fletcher to record his vote on the consent items for the record. Uh, this is, this is still a time. I still don't know what's happened with my complaint. Um, Ms. Khan, the, um, I believe Mr. Kennedy uh, responded to, to that. If you want to have some follow up offline, um, you may do so. Uh, but the public hearing is closed. Council member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had technical problems and wasn't able to register my vote for the uh, uh, consent agenda. I'd like to be counted as a yes if there are no objections. Noted. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, now we can go to the discussion items. And with that, um, I will again give the floor back to Director Jelly. Thank you, Chair Reich. Uh, item 23 is on a presentation on obstruction permit fees. And Jennifer Lowry, a principal professional engineer with Traffic and Parking Services, will present this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. I am Jennifer Lowry, as he said. I'm in the parking, traffic and parking services, and I work with Scott Kramer, who is the other lead on this request for council action. Scott leads a team of four individuals, amazing individuals on the lane use team. Um, next slide, please. So it'll just be a quick presentation um, to explain what's before you today, which is to update the city's obstruction permit fees. I'll cover the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Next slide. So um, the public right of way equals about 22% of the land area in the city. And the city regulates the use of that right of way through several permits including um, through the roughly 15,000 obstruction permits that are issued annually by this lane use group, which exists in the Public Works Traffic and Parking Services Division. So to perform work or to have exclusive use of all or portions of the right of way, everyone, including our own crews, should obtain an obstruction permit. The permit itself can currently be obtained at no cost. However, the, the ordinance allows um, for the obstruction fees to include management costs and disruption costs to the traveling public. The fees associated with the actual closure of sidewalks or lanes um, are the disruption costs, which we also call the lane use fees. So note that the obstruction permit is the mechanism for people to request hooding of meters or posting of no parking. However, costs such as the lost revenue associated with meter hooding is not a part of this proposal. Additionally, Public Works regulates the right array through other permits such as the excavation permit for below ground work, utility connection permit and encroachment permit, etc., which are also not a part of this proposal. Next slide. So in 2001, we began to charge lane use fees for obstruction permits. The reduction in the amount of space and the duration of use of the right of way was immediately apparent. There is a lot happening in our right of way and all these are things are constantly changing, being events, construction, emergencies. So the obstruction permit helps us know who is where and when. So this in turn helps the city protect public assets um, because damage to our assets can occur at the time of the work or months or years later. Um, and also to preserve the public space needed to um, maintain the movement of people, goods and services within the city. So regardless of which mode of travel you use, um, there is a network to maintain that access. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so this update seeks to minimize the impacts to the right of way and the traveling public by encouraging less use of the right of way and for shorter durations of time. So two ways we're approaching this, um, the inflationary value of space. So lane use fees were established in 2001 and then slightly amended in 2006, but they have not increased since that time. 
Therefore, they're a very inexpensive option um, for use of space that results in higher usage of our public right of way. And in some cases, that space is abused. We also want to align better with our city goals and priorities. So we want to limit um, impacts to specific modes of travel, such as walking. Um, our focus is to improve and encourage people, uh, improve the sidewalks and bike lanes to encourage people to make trips by biking, walking, or using transit, um, as stated in our transportation action, action plan and our complete streets policies. Um, in this, uh, these graphics, you'll see the multi multimodal priorities um, that you're familiar with. So at the top is our pedestrian is our highest priority. And then on the right side, you'll see in 2019, um, if we looked at the lane use fees that were charged for downtown, um, it makes sense that the green is the parking lane, which aligns with our lowest priority on the uh, modal priorities. But our second largest used space was our sidewalks. So that was um, around 30% of the lane use fees were associated with sidewalk closures. And our goal is to either eliminate or significantly reduce um, impacts to those sidewalks and shrink that blue area. Next slide, please. So how we're doing that or how we're accomplishing those goals in part, we want to raise our prices to at a minimum reflect the inflation or the true current disruptive cost to the public. And then we also need to adjust those fees relative to one another to align with our goals and policies. So our current rates are two tiered, you'll see on the left. Um, so what we wanna do is price our sidewalk more than the parking lane or moving lanes to discourage sidewalk closures during construction. And then we create a third tier so that we're able to adjust the sidewalk and bike lane fees accordingly. So if you follow the arrows on the right, table, we create a third column, make the sidewalks most expensive and bring bike lanes up to the same cost as the moving lane. It is important to note that the moving lane is also um, where buses and emergency vehicles travel. So that's why the bike lane and the transit moving lane are on the same level. After these adjustments, we'll continue to further review best practices from pure cities, such as, such as fixed fees, changes in fee based on the time duration of the project, etc. But our first um, step is increasing these fees. Next slide. So our fees currently apply in on downtown and arterial streets. So downtown is um, shown in the red. You can go to the next one and then the one after that kind of quickly. So then we have arterial streets, which is shown in the orange. And then the third, we're adding um, uh, other category called all other streets. So this proposal would add a, a tier that covers all other streets that aren't covered by downtown and arterial that for which the city permits. So it wouldn't include parkways, freeways, University of Minnesota streets, etc. But it's reflected in all the blue streets you see there. Next, please. Uh, pending council approval, we propose these changes go into effect on January 1st of next year, 2022. That will give us time to work out some of the implement implementation details and also to provide advance notice for private projects to plan and budget accordingly. Next slide. Thanks. So we took this information that I just presented and um, did some engagement with the public. We sent over 8,000 notices via email about the changes. These were sent to people who had previously obtained an obstruction permit and people who are on CPED's development um, notices gov delivery list. We held three virtual meetings in June and recorded the session, a session that was posted on the website. The website was also updated a few times and 26 formal comments were received. So of those comments, 17 were positive and or suggested higher fees for sidewalk and or bike lanes. Six disapproved of the proposal and or asked that fees not be applied equally to certain users or applicants. And then three just had kind of clarifying questions of, of on the material. Next slide, please. So this shows the proposed fees. On the top is the current. You'll see the dollar amounts and the tiers. So it's just low or high tiers. On the bottom, you'll see the proposed fees. So we create the three tiers, having sidewalk is the highest, 
And the upper left, the 175 is the highest. And then you go to the bottom uh, right, which is the 25 cents is the lowest. And um, everything else kind of falls in between. We did not make changes to our approach based on the comments received because it they were more supportive. Um, next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, the, the proposal before you today asked for three things, to increase the fees for the downtown and arterial streets, to establish and define an all other streets category, and then to establish fees associated with those all other streets. This concludes our presentation, so thank you for your consideration, and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, do any committee members have questions um, for the presenter? Not in just a minute. Oh, Councilmember Fletcher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to express my appreciation to staff for working through this. I uh, uh, I think it's really good policy. I, uh, as someone who represents uh, a award that is partially covered by the downtown uh, obstruction rules and that partially isn't. Uh, I know that often there is real frustration with lanes that'll be taken for uh, a lot longer than it seems like they need to be because there's very limited incentive to not do so at a construction site. And uh, I think starting to apply fees and starting to uh, take seriously the uh, imposition that it puts on pedestrians and bicyclists and drivers uh, when you're using a lane for some other purpose is going to be very helpful in uh, hopefully encouraging uh, projects to be uh, more expedient in how much obstruction they uh, engage in and also uh, you know to make sure that, uh, that that we're managing that space and incentivizing the right kinds of obstructions uh, so that we minimize impact so I uh, appreciate this. Uh, I think it's something that we're going to have to keep monitoring and see how this works for a while and then uh, see if we need to make further adjustments. But I think uh, this is a real step in the right direction that feels really uh, like a like a, a solid step forward uh, from our transportation action plan work. So thank you. Thank you for those comments, uh, Council Member. And I know very early on you were a very clear observer and voice on this issue for some time. So thanks for your comments. Councilmember Bender. Thanks, Mr. Chair. To you and, and Councilmember Fletcher, uh, who you noted has really been pleading on this um, or asking for it. I just wanted to reflect um, how great it is to see Public Works really referring to our adopted policies and really making sure that all of these different aspects of what happens in our right of way are aligned with our policies. And you know they're only as good as our commitment to implementing them. So I just really want to invoice my appreciation and my support for us to continue to really lean into the transportation action plan, Vision Zero, our complete streets policy. We put a lot of effort into engaging the community around those policies. You know the really collaborative effort within Public Works itself to come forward with the transportation action plan. There was a uh, huge support for that plan in the council, I think reflecting the public support for this direction. So just thank you for continuing to refer to those and to bring them to life in our right of way to make sure that everything that happens there is aligned with those outcomes that we want to see, especially safety for the most vulnerable users. And when we see these obstructions, as Councilmember Fletcher said, especially go on for um, a very long time, it, it really does create significant safety issues uh, for our constituents. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Council President Bender. And um, yeah, in addition to um, uh, echoing the thanks for the work in this report, um, really well done, very clear uh, what is being accomplished here or attempt to be accomplished with this report, very well done. But I really like what Council President Bender said about how this work brings to life, uh, as she well put it, um, our policies. So they are not abstractions uh, or academic, uh, but really how we um, do our business here in the city and how people get to enjoy the city uh, because of these policies are mindful of them and their safety. So um, uh, extremely well done. And uh, I wanted to echo the thanks uh, to you. Anyone else from the committee wish to make comment? Um, 
appreciate that. And with that, um, we will um, move a passage of resolution designating this obstruction permit fee policy. And I will ask the clerk to confirm it with the roll. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Palmasano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Chair Reich. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries, and we now can go to the final item, discussion item number 24, and I will call upon Director Jelly. Thank you, Chair Reich, and, uh, and uh, thank you to committee members for the kind words and uh, support of staff um, knowledge. That was uh, a lot of really good work and exciting step forward. So item 24 is the Your City, Your Streets 2020 Progress Report and Trey Joyner, Associate Transportation Planner with Transportation Planning and Programming will present this item. Thank you, Director Jerry, Jelly, uh, Chair Reich and members of the Council. Uh, my name is Trey Joyner. I'm an Associate Transportation Planner in Public Works Transportation Planning and Programming Division, and I'll be presenting on the Your City, Your Streets 2020 Progress Report as mandated by the Parks and Streets Funding Ordinance. Next slide, please. So in 2017, Council passed the 20 year Parks and Streets Funding Ordinance, which guaranteed a minimal annual funding for city streets. In combination with that Parks and Streets Funding Ordinance, the 20 year streets funding plan uh, uses a combination of asset condition, demographic and user information to help prioritize projects in the CIP. This ordinance also calls for a report back, which I'm here uh, presenting on uh, for you today. Uh, and I'll just note that this presentation isn't a comprehensive list uh, or exhaustive list of all the work done by Public Works, but I'll briefly be highlighting some of the key projects completed last year. Next slide, please. So I'd like to example some of our other work not funded by the ordinance, but it was also completed last year. These initiatives show instances where public works adapted to changes in our streets during 2020, while also advancing key city goals. Examples of this are a mobility hub initiative, the 20 and 20 intersection improvement initiative, and also the Stay Healthy Streets initiative. Next slide, please. So since 2017, since the ordinance was passed, Public Works has completed 143 miles of work, which include resurfacing, reconstruction, and rehabilitation of streets. 42 miles of that work were completed in ACP 50 areas, and ACP 50 is designed, defined as 50% or more of the population identifying as BIPOC. Next slide, please. Also in 2017, as it relates to bikes and pedestrian improvements, the city completed 17 miles of protected bike lanes, about 1,800 ADA ramp upgrades, 30 miles of uh, pedestrian realm improvements, including sidewalks and boulevards, and about 538 curb extensions. Next slide, please. In 2020, in last year in 2020, uh, as it relates to streets, the city public works completed 24 intersection upgrades, including traffic circles, curb extensions, and medians. Uh, 13 inner signal upgrades, 32 uh, miles of work in uh, general of general work, and which includes resurfacing, re, uh, reconstruction, and re, um, rehabilitation, and also 13.1 uh, of those miles in ACP 50 areas. Next slide, please. So get to the meat of the presentation. I'll be briefly highlighting some of the projects completed last year um, and exampling some of the improvements made on those projects. First up is the Hennepin Avenue South Downtown Phase One Street reconstruction. This was a, this is a reconstruction currently ongoing um, from Washington to 12th. Uh, phase One was a southern half of uh, Hennepin, and Phase Two uh, is the northern half of Hennepin ongoing this year. This project included sidewalk uh, able to support pedestrian activities, space for planting and furnishing zones, one-way bike lanes behind the curb, as you can see it with the darkened concrete in the image and space for enhanced transit stops compatible with future arterial bus rapid transit service. Next slide, please. The next project was the Girard Avenue South Street reconstruction. This was from Lake as a one block project from Lake to Lagoon. As you can see in the image, uh, the project included expanded sidewalk, furnishing zones out on the west side of the street, traffic signal replacements, curb extensions, ADA compliant pedestrian ramps, pedestrian street level lighting, and vegetated swells in the boulevard, as you can see on the left side of the image. Next slide, please. The next project was the 18th Avenue South, uh, 18th Avenue Northeast Street reconstruction. This project connected to the 18th Avenue Northeast Street reconstruction in 2017 and 2018, and the ongoing reconstruction of Johnson Street Northeast from Lowry to um, 18th. Uh, 
Um, this project included ADA compliant pedestrian ramps. It closed some sidewalk and trail gaps in front of, of the post office, which is the building on the left side of the screen. Added boulevard, including street trees and pedestrian curb extensions. Yep, and next slide, please. This project was on the Fremont Avenue South Bridge over the Midtown Greenway. It was formally closed to vehicle traffic in 2016 due to the, the, the condition of the bridge. Um, this was a joint county and city funded project and included a new bridge with widened sidewalks, narrow travel lanes, and new ADA head ramps and curb extensions. Next slide, please. This project was a part of our residential street reconstruction program, and it was the first project in our residential reconstruction program. And I'd just like to highlight the um, the, the ordinance's ability to to fill some of these, uh, to do some of these this this work in residential streets where the condition of the street has degraded to a point where resurfacing is uh, not a great treatment. This project included 0.75 miles of streets in the Waite Park neighborhood of Northeast Minneapolis, included several cur uh, curb extensions, widened boulevards narrow travel lanes and mid block pump outs. Next slide, please. This is an example of our Dorman Avenue paving area or um, this in the Longfellow neighborhood as an example of residential street uh, of a residential street resurfacing project. And as you can see in the image, this project included bump outs and new ADA pad ramps with a connection to the Midtown Greenway. Next slide, please. This project was a part of our parkway resurfacing program, which is closely coordinated with the Minneapolis Park and Recreations Board as we identify candidates to include in the uh, parkway program. This was phase one of the Theodore Worth Parkway resurfacing, which extended from 28th Avenue Northeast to Olson Memorial Highway. Um, and in this year, we'll also be completing phase two of this program, which is primarily located in the northern uh, or the southern half of the of Theodore Worth Parkway. Um, and then in 2023, we'll be coming back doing a sill coat uh, with the applying the signature Parkway red red uh, chip sill coat. Next slide, please. South, this was the Southwest Northern uh, Street Reconstruction, um, <clears throat> also funded um, uh, uh, because of the uh, 20 year streets funding plan ordinance. It was at 0.8 miles of work, which included um, ADA ramps, the closing of sidewalk gaps, several curb extensions, um, and um, green and stormwater improvements, as you can see in the boulevard space. Next slide, please. So I'd like to kind of highlight some of our uh, pedestrian accomplishments in 2020. The city built 2.1 miles of improved pedestrian rail, including sidewalks and boulevards. Uh, in that 2.1 miles, we did 67 curb extensions. We filled sidewalk gaps, installed 1.3 miles of pedestrian street lighting, made 2.2 miles of miles of safety conversions where we narrowed the travel lanes and 441 ADA ramp upgrades. Next slide, please. This project was a part of our PBO 56, our uh, resurfacing program at Bloomington Avenue and 29th Street closing, uh, crossing treatments. This project in, included the installation of new curb extensions, reducing the crossing distance for pedestrians, installing ADA pedestrian ramps, installing intersection lighting and a rap, rectangular rapid flashing beacon. And we also did stormwater prunes um, or bioswells in the bump outs installed with this project. Next slide, please. This project was a part of our pedestrian safety program, BP004. Uh, it included the upgraded, created four upgraded pedestrian ramps, new marked crosswalks, which aren't in this image. This was a construction photo, uh, but they are out uh, today, and two pedestrian refuse islands. Um, this project also um, doubled down on installing uh, uh, pedestrian treatment uh, as a part of the Northrop Elementary's uh, nearby schools, uh, Safe Routes to School plan. Next slide, please. This project was also a part of our pedestrian safety program. It was the Oak Road Pedestrian and Bicycle Project. Uh, it runs along 15th Street West from South Hennepin Ave to Oak Grove Street. It included new pedestrian ramps, um, curb extensions, and an upgraded on-street bike lanes to curb protected bike lanes. Next slide, please. I just want to highlight the work that we're doing uh, in regards to our ADA transition plan. Uh, last year, the city built and upgraded 84 curb, ramp, curb ramps in 2020 all across the city. Next slide, please. As a part of uh, some of that, uh, that work with our, our, our ADA focused work, uh, the city partnered with our streets to install a healthy trips, 
Healthy City Wayfinding Program. 90 of these decals were, were placed along sidewalks and streets across the city to direct people during COVID to uh, essential businesses like grocery stores. Next slide, please. The next up is our, our bicycle focus uh, projects and programs. Uh, the city installed 2.4 miles of bicycle facilities. Um, 1.2 miles are protected bicycle facilities, and of that 1.2 miles uh, or 2.4 miles, 0.4 miles were installed in ATP, ACP 50 areas in the city. Next slide, please. This was our Grant Street uh, Bikeway project funded out of uh, Big 28, our bikeway program, protected bikeway program. It extended from Grant Street uh, on Grant Street from 12th Avenue South to 1st Avenue South, then along 1st Avenue South to 15th Street East. It builds a uh, all ages all abilities facility connection to an off street bikeway built in 2018 along the northern end of the convention center. Next slide please. And finally, this is um, a project in our safe process school program, um, which filled a gap in our presence bicycle boulevard um, uh, bikeway uh, in northeast Minneapolis. This was a uh, joint city and county project. The city project was from 5th Avenue Southeast uh, along East Hennepin Avenue to Pierce Street Northeast. It was 0.12 miles of a trail connection and 0.6 miles of on street bikeways um, from 8th Street uh, Southeast to Johnson Street Southeast, in addition to uh, um, installed uh, county led installed ADA ramps and a resurfacing of East Hennepin Avenue from uh, and a resurfacing East Hennepin Avenue, where we converted a four lane facility into a three lane facility. This project also included um, curb extensions and new ADA ramps at all four corners of the intersection with uh, 5th Avenue Southeast and East Hennepin Avenue, a new signal and uh, off street uh, bi directional bikeway. And this concludes my presentation. I will happy to stay along for any questions. Thank you for that presentation. Um, really good visuals. Anyone wish to um, have questions or make comment for this presentation? Um, Council President Bender. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just echo a lot of the themes from earlier, but it's just extraordinary to see how much the policy work we've all done and um, the investment that we collectively made in our infrastructure back in 2017, to see that really come to life in our right of way. And especially to see the significance of our collective commitment to race equity, we're one of the only cities in the country that I still know of that uses race equity, equity explicitly in our capital program. It's something I talk about a lot with elected officials from around the country as one of the levers that we can use. Um, you know, we own the right of way. We invest millions and millions of dollars as a community in our streets, and they should be working for our whole community. They should be serving the community. They should be supporting safety and access. And the fact that we've been able to leverage the streets investment with our commitments to safety and equitable access is really meaningful. And it's um, it's important because it's it's money that we were putting in, you know, for infrastructure for something that's very uh, often I think very confined. You know, we have a capital program. We're going to do these particular streets, and we've been able to integrate into that. Um, these values that our city has. So thanks to the staff um, truly for shepherding through this huge change in how we think about our streets and public right of way, for having all of the thousands of conversations with property owners and residents and business owners that led to each one of the projects that you highlighted. Even if you just look at the curb extensions and the ADA improvements that have happened, that alone is really extraordinary work. And to put it together with the speed reductions and the infrastructure shifts that support safety and access, it's just an extraordinary body of work. I, I'm so proud to have played a small role in it and really want to thank the staff for all of their effort in, like I said, bringing it to life in our city. Thank you for those comments. Um, Councilmember Fletcher. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I want to uh, pile on the praise a little bit. I know that uh, sometimes our constituents do feel a little frustrated because we are doing a lot of work. Uh, and that ends up being a lot of uh, temporary obstructions when when we've got uh, uh, this road work in progress. But uh, Trey, I know you personally have uh, a fan club in my ward over the East Hennepin work. Uh, <laughs> and I know that each of these projects that you highlighted has staff behind it uh, and grateful residents who had a chance to weigh in on these projects and then see them come to fruition. So I just wanna really uh, thank everybody who's dug in. There's some there's some very specific and individualized and and context specific work that and thought that's gone into uh, a lot of these projects to really make them work for everybody and uh, a lot of parts of our city that are more accessible and and that just work better for everyone because of the good work that you all are doing. So thank you for that, and it's great to see this update. Thank you for those comments, Council Member. Uh, anyone else from the committee? Um, I will um, also echo the, the comments made by my colleagues. Um, you know, certainly we, when we made this investment, this commitment, it wasn't just um, an expansion of our um, asset management uh, with, with more resources, uh, but it was an expansion of how, and I think Council President Bender uh, pointed this out, it was an expansion of how we leverage these investments beyond just asset management, which is very important, into so many other goals. And, um, and yes, the equity um, goals that was highlighted by Council President Bender uh, certainly is a key one, uh, but even you can pick almost any project and see how it leveraged something beyond just uh, infrastructure asset management, um, connections to schools uh, with the, with the um, uh, Safe Routes to Schools investments and how important that link was. Um, the environmental, I mean, so many of those um, street projects, for example, the one that was highlighted in Hoyer Heights, um, that's, you know, directly purifying the water supply of our city. So it's uh, really impressive to see how we've expanded uh, resource uh, investment, but also leveraging the uh, importance and value through these other applications and achieving other goals from equity to environment, et cetera. Um, and in a very, very, very well done uh, uh, progress report. I, I think it flowed very nicely and tells the story very well. And I think it's a story that needs to be out there to the public. Uh, so very well done uh, to staff. Anyone else from the committee? If not, I would move um, this item uh, for the record and have the clerk call the world. Council Member Gordon. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council, Mem Sorry Council, about that. Me Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Almasano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Chair Rake. Aye. Six ayes. That carries. Um, and that concludes the items on our agenda. And if there is no objection from committee members, um, I will call this meeting adjourned and thank everyone uh, who prepared the items for this meeting.